Welcome back to part two of creating your first game in GDevelop 5. We're going to pick up right where we left off at the end of episode one. What we've done so far is we've created a project and we have our player ship controllable by the arrow keys on the keyboard. And if you go far enough to the edge of the screen, we have uh, a walls set up there that will block the player. So we've just got this started. Where we left off at the end of episode one, we had set up these controls with a player moving by applying a force of five pixels per second in the various directions. I hard coded that as the five and negative five in here. I don't really wanna leave it that way. I wanna make that a variable. So what we're gonna do is we're going to make that a global variable. So we want to go to the project settings, which is right up here, project manager, go to game settings, and then go to global variables. I'm going to set up a few global variables while we're here. We're going to end up actually setting up more than this, but I'm going to set up the first few to get us started. So first, I want to make one called player speed. I'm going to set that to the five that we've already used over here. And I'm going to add another one. This one I'm going to call player max speed. So what I'm going to want to do is set up a maximum speed for this player so it doesn't go too fast while it's moving around on screen. And you can also use both of these numbers, the player speed and the max speed. We could use those as the game progresses in difficulty. We could have the player move faster or be allowed to move faster by adjusting these variables. So they're nice to have as a variable versus being hard coded like we did in episode one. So right now I'm just going to put, let's say 100 in here. We're gonna change that. I just want to show you how this is going to work. Now let's set up a couple more global variables while we're here. I wanna set one up. We know we're gonna need a score at some point. I'm gonna set that up and just make it zero for now. I'm also gonna set one up for wave. So we can keep count of the game's waves. I'm also going to set that to zero to start with. I'm going to add one more for lives, and that will keep count of the player's lives. Again, I'm just going to make it zero for now. We're not going to be editing these or using them right now. I just want them to be there since we're here in the global variables. The player speed and the player max speed or what we're going to look at right now. So I'm going to apply those. Let's go back to the gameplay events. And I'm going to change these events now. Instead of using 5 as a hard-coded value, I'm going to click on that 5. Delete that. And then as I start to type variable, I have the option to choose a global variable right here. So I'm going to click that and then I'm going to use player speed, that global variable we just created. Now you have to make sure that you keep the upper and lower case of what you type in here to match exactly what we just created or else they won't work correctly. So these variable names are case sensitive. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to use it just to paste into here. I want to keep the negative sign and then paste that. I'm going to go through and do these other ones. Again, I want to keep the negative sign and paste. And let's paste that right there. I'm going to preview this 
and you'll see it works exactly like it was before. So that's perfect. But now the big change with that is if I want to change this player speed throughout the game, I can just change the value of that variable. Now I could go in here and I could say, you know, go to these variables and change player speed to something else right there. That would kind of defeat the purpose, obviously. So what I can do is through events, I can change player speed to something else. I'm not going to add a condition to this right now. Normally there would be a condition, but I'm just going to change the player speed to something else so you can see how it works. So again, I'm going to start to type variable in the search box up here at the top. And then I can adjust a value of a global variable right here. I want to adjust player speed. Let's make it really slow. I'm going to set it to 1. So now player speed will equal 1 instead of 5. And as I move the ship, it does move, it increases in speed, but you can see it increases much more slowly than it did with the 5. And of course, conversely, I could come in here and make it 50, 10 times our previous speed. And you'll see it moves extremely fast. So just by adjusting that variable now, we can adjust the speed of the player's ship. Now the next thing I'm going to want to do is use that player max speed so we can essentially cap the speed at which the player will move. So I'm going to create a new event. I'm going to add a condition to that. I'm going to say when the player ship, and we'll do the X and Y direction first across the screen to the right and left. So when the linear velocity of the player, if that is, we'll do to the right first. So if that is greater than, we're going to use that variable, global variable. In this case, I'm going to use player max speed. So what we have here is if the linear velocity x of the player ship is greater than whatever we have the max speed set up at, which right now in our case was 100, I don't ever want it to go over that speed. So to do that, or to limit that, I'm going to add an action. And in the player ship, I'm going to set the linear velocity x equal to, I'm going to start to type variable, so that global variable, player max speed. So now what this says is, if this player ship is moving to the right at more than the player max speed because it's greater than, it's going to change the speed at which it's moving, its linear velocity x, to the player max speed. So if it over here, if it equals 110, it's going to say, oh, it can't equal 110. We want it to only equal 100. So this is essentially going to act as a speed limit on the player. I'm going to want to copy this, and then paste it, and I want to check for moving to the left. So let me double click this so we can get the whole thing at once. I want to make it less than, and then I want to put the negative value in here because now we would be moving to the left instead of the right. So we want it to be minus 100 or minus the player max speed. And then what we want to change over here is just to change it to the negative or the minus 
player max speed. So now remember, let me close this. Remember we have our speed set very high here. And in the previous preview of the project, the player ship would move extremely fast right away. Let's preview this now. With that speed limit in there, when I move to the right or left, you'll see my speed is limited to that 100. That is the player max speed. Now I haven't set it up for the Y direction yet. So if I try to move up or down, I'm still going to move extremely fast. So let's put in those speed limits for the Y direction as well. I'm again going to paste the condition that we've already copied and update this to linear velocity y instead of linear velocity x because now we're going to be moving up and down the screen. So we'll do the less than first. If linear velocity y is less than the player max speed, We'll set linear velocity y equal to negative max speed. I'm going to copy this now that it's all set up for the y axis. Paste it again. And just do the updates on this to make it greater than. Take the negative sign out of here. Do that same update over here. Just take the negative sign out. Let's preview that. Now when I move up, it's got its speed limit down, it's got its speed limit. And for some reason moving to the left got messed up, which seems to happen sometimes. And I see my player X's, one of them got messed up when I copied and pasted. So let's just fix that. This would be the less than. Put the minus sign in here. And then come over here. Put the minus sign in there. That's why it's always good to play test your games constantly every time you make a change. Something that's certainly going to be a major change. You always want to play test that before you get too far into it. So you can quickly make the change or edit the mistake and fix it. So hopefully that's all fixed. Now I have my speed limit in all four directions. So even though my player ship sh should theoretically move really fast, it's not because I have that speed limit on it. I do want the player ship, of course, to move faster than this. So let's fix this up. Let's take this condition out where we were setting the player speed to that ridiculously high 50. That was just for demo purposes only. I'm going to highlight that whole condition and just press delete to get rid of it. And then also in the global variables, I think I want the player ship max speed to be something closer to 400. I'll set it to that for now and we'll see how it goes. We may adjust it later. But the player speed of 5 and player speed of 400 seems to work pretty well for the game we're making today anyway. Let's see how that feels. So there you go. With the, with the speed of 5, it takes a, a second to accelerate to max speed. And then the, the 400 seems fast enough to get from side to side and top to bottom. So again, in your game, of course, you can adjust those numbers however you like. But for this tutorial, I'm going to leave it at the 5 and the 400 for now. Now what I do want to do is I want to organize these behaviors a little bit, or these conditions. I want to group them into groups. So I'm going to select these top four that control the movement, and I'm holding down my shift key 
and selecting each one of those. After the four of those are selected, I'm going to right click and at the bottom of the menu that pops up, I'm going to choose Move Events into Group. And that'll do just that. You see it, it closed them up into this group called Grouped Events. If I click the down arrow, it exposes everything within that group. I'm going to close that up and I want to rename this. I don't want it to be called Grouped Events. I'm going to be call it Move Player. There we go. I'm going to select these remaining four conditions. Do the same thing. Right click. And move into group. I'm just going to name this Player Speed Limits. Figured that was a good time to save the project, so I just did a Command S on that. And now you can see these are just organized a little more nicely. As we build up more conditions and actions here, it could get awfully confusing if you can organize that somehow. It definitely helps readability, and it also tells you exactly what goes on in this group. Even if you weren't working on this project, if you were working as part of a group, and somebody who was unfamiliar with what you've done so far, sat down here, they would quickly be able to recognize the group move player has all the move actions in the group player speed limits controls the maximum speed of the player because they're named appropriately. So it's always a good habit to get into that. Now let's go back to the gameplay screen and let's add our background or space background element to this scene. So to do that, I'm going to add a new object. And this object is going to be a sprite. Now, I think a lot of times in games, people think of a sprite as just being a character or some sort of moving object in the game, whether it's a player or an enemy or some type of animation. But they can really be any image. They can be a static image. In this case, it's just going to be a static background image. The, if you were doing something in, a, in an outdoor setting, maybe you would have a tree or a bush or a rock that just sits there. Really doesn't interact with the game. It's just a scenery element. But those are sprites as well. So anytime you're going to use an image in your game, it's either going to be a sprite or a tiled sprite like we used for the walls here. So I'm going to choose a sprite. I'm going to call this Space Background. And let's add an animation, which is really just going to be a static image. I'm going to go to our assets and load in Star Background right there. Just going to apply that. I'm going to bring it in here. I'm going to eyeball it right there, but I'm going to set it up correctly. I'm going to adjust the X to be 0 and the Y to be 0. So you'll see now that space background is over top everything in our project. Everything else is still there, you just can't see it. I could press my arrow keys and you can't see it, but the player is moving around in the background underneath the stars. Obviously, we don't want the stars on top. So there's a couple things we could do about that. I can select the stars and every object, everything that we create over here, and then drag onto our stage has a Z order. Over here in the Properties palette, the Z order of this star background right now is 4. And our project just numbered it that way. As you drag in objects into your scene, it's going to auto-number them for you. And the higher the number, the more close to the player or the camera these objects are. 
So if I were to change this to, I'm just going to pick, I'm going to make it a negative 4. Since they had it as 4, why not make it a negative 4? Now you'll see that moved it behind everything else. So let's check the Z order on this stuff. The player's Z order is 1. Minus 4 is behind that. These walls are 2, 2, 3, 3. So let's see, the player was 1, the walls were 2. Let me make this a 2. And you'll see it came in front of the player. The player is now behind the stars, but this 2 and this 3 are still above the stars. If I were to make the stars a 3, it's going to block out some of the walls, but not all of the walls. So again, we want that to be all the way in the background. So I could make it a 0. And that's fine. Now there's another way to do that. I'm going to put it back to 4. There we go. Now it's on top of everything. You'll see over here, there's a layers palette. If you don't have the layers palette showing, you can come up here to this button right here and do open the layers editor. And then this palette will show up for you. It may not show up in this location, but you can adjust the screen layout of all of these palettes in GDevelop. So I'm going to scroll this up just so we can see it a little better. You can drag this out. I could put it over here if I wanted to. You'll see as I move it around areas of the screen highlight. If I were to let it go there, the layers palette is now right here next to the properties palette. I could split this in half like that. And then I have an objects groups and a layers palette right there. If you want your layers palette at the top, you can move it up there. So you can move these things around and create your work environment the way you like. I like my layers right there in the bottom right hand corner. So once you have your layers, right now everything in our game has been created on this base layer. If you don't create other layers or tell GDevelop to put objects on specific layers, it's always going to add stuff to the base layer. But what you can do is you can add your own layers here. I'm going to add a layer. And I'm going to rename it background. You also always get a background color layer that you can't delete. In GDevelop, what you can do is change the color of it, and that is the background color of your scene. If you don't have something covering the entire background, you would get this color. But what I want to do now is I'm going to drag this layer. You can reorder these. If I grab this little handle here. I can reorder these, and if I drag the background layer behind the base layer, I can come over here select this sprite, this space background, and then right here underneath the Z order, there is a layer drop-down menu. I can say, move this space background to the background layer. And because the background layer is underneath the base layer, everything on the base layer will always be above the background layer. I could make this Z order 100 now. And it doesn't matter or it doesn't affect the base layer because the base layer is always on top of the background. It does, of course, matter to the background layer. If there were multiple elements on the background, this Z order is going to affect only the background. So each layer has its own set of Z order elements or objects. 
So I hope that makes sense. We're going to leave this star background in here on its own layer called background. So now that we have that background in there, let's move on. There is something I want to change on this player ship. In the behaviors, there's an option here. Well, in the physics 2 behavior that we have applied to it, there's an option here to fix the rotation of this ship. And I want to turn that on. I didn't turn it on last episode, and I meant to. Let me explain to you why I want to do that. I'm going to add a temporary wall character here because that was static. And I want this ship to bump into the wall so we can see what's going to happen. When I fly the ship around in open space, everything is fine. It's rotating. The image is rotating because of its animation frames that we brought into the object. But if I collide with the corner of this wall that I just brought in there, you'll see that the sprite itself rotates along with the animation. Let me collide again. And then the sprite begins to rotate. I don't want that to happen. So in order to stop that, you can go to this physics behavior and do fixed rotation. Once you make that active, when you collide with things like we were just doing, it will not rotate the sprite. You can see when I collide with that wall, my sprite keeps the same rotation. The image is animating again, but the sprite isn't spinning around. This highlight here on the glass or the blue globe always points up the screen. That's what I want. In this game, there is an imaginary light source up here at the top shining down on everything. So I don't want these highlights to be spinning around in weird directions. So now that that's fixed, I'm going to delete this wall since it doesn't belong there. But you might have noticed, actually, let me undo that. You might have noticed when the player ship collides with this wall, it's, as I get up to the corner here, It's colliding even though there's nothing here. There's dead space, there's transparency around this ship. So let's work with these collision shapes a little bit. In the player ship, since it has a physics behavior applied to it, we can adjust a collision shape right here, right in the center of the physics dialog box is where we can control the physics collision shape. And that's important. There's two different collision shapes that objects can have in GDevelop. One, they have a default collision shape. Just any object gets it whether it has a physics behavior applied to it or not. But when you apply a physics behavior to an object, it gets a second collision shape. And this informational dialog box here right here discusses that a little bit and we'll look into that a little deeper in this tutorial as well you can read this i'm going to leave this alone for now but what i want to do is change the shape to a circle and you can get a preview of this right now you don't get any previews but you can get a preview. I'm going to load in one of my player ship images right here. And then you get a little preview in this box. If I choose a shape box, you'll see this red area indicates what the collision shape is going to be. Let me rephrase that. It indicates what the physics body's collision shape is going to be. So with a box, it goes all the way to the four corners of that box. So even this transparent space out here is covered by the collision shape. If I were to choose circle, 
it closes it in to a perfect circle within your square. So because my ship is a perfect circle within this square, they cover each other perfectly. That is ultimately the shape I'm going to want here. But let me just show you, you can also choose an edge. It's probably hard to see, but there's a red line right through the center of the ship here. That is the default edge that you get when you choose edge. You can adjust that right here. If I wanted my edge to move up, let's see, I'm going to pick 30 pixels. Let's see what happens. Oh, it moved down. And of course, up would be the negative direction. So you can see as I change the shape offset Y, this edge is moving up and down within my sprite. I'm going to take that back to zero. And you can also choose polygon. And when you do that, let me scroll down here a little bit. You can add points. I'm just going to click to add a few of these. I'm not really going to use them. I just want to show you. It starts to add points here in the center of your object. Then you can drag these points around and the red area that you get would be the collision shape of that object. So you can add points and follow the edge of your circle or if you had an odd shaped sprite you could follow the edge of that sprite. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to take this back to circle. And you'll see it resets it to a circle which is what I want in our case right now. But here's an important distinction with that. That was our physics body collision shape. The wall is also a physics body and it's set to box. So this collision shape should work correctly. As I get close to the wall now, you can see the corner of my ship or the edge of the circle of my ship can go right up to the corner of the wall. And I wasn't able to do that before when I had the square collision shape. But let's see what happens. If I go to this wall, you know what, let's not go to the wall. Let's create a new object because we're going to need it anyway. I'm going to create a new sprite. And let's create our power cell. I'm going to add a new animation. And I'm going to select the power cells 1 through 10. That's the frames of animation for the power cell. I'm going to open that up. And this power cell is not going to be a physics object. It's not going to move around. We don't need any fancy physics with it. It's just going to sit in space and wait until the player ship picks it up. So we don't need all that overhead of adding the physics behavior to that. But what's going to happen with that is, let me drag one of these in here and preview this. So you'll see as the player ship gets over here, since the power cell is not a physics object, the player ship is not colliding with it, like it does with the wall physics object. Collisions with physics objects, remember, are just built in. It's part of the physics engine. So how do I get this player ship to interact with a non-physics object? There's a few things we're going to have to do to do that. One of the first things is to add an event. I'm going to add a new event. And let's say when the player ship, we want that to collide with the power cell. Now the player ship, because we have a physics behavior attached to it, it has this physics collision. See, it says behavior physics 2 when I select physics collision here, that will collide with other physics objects. 
but we're not going to make the power cell a physics object. So we're not going to be able to use this collision. We're going to have to use the non-physics collision, which is right here under collision. You want to make sure and use this one. This will let a physics body collide with a non-physics body. Or, of course, non-physics bodies collide with each other. Now, once I select collision, it auto-fills with physics 2 only because I had this collision selected to start with. I, of course, want to take physics 2 out of there. And you have to pick which object you're going to want the player ship to collide with. And I want it to collide with the power cell. And I'm going to OK that. So what do we want to happen when the player ship collides with the power cell? First, we want to have the power cell be deleted from the scene. So I selected power cell, and then we want to delete an object, which is going to delete the power cell. So when the player ship collides with the power cell, we want that power cell to delete. Let's try that out. So as I move over here, you'll see the player ship touched it and it deleted. But now something weird's going to happen and I need to slow the player ship down for this so it doesn't move so quickly. I'm going to go to global variables. I'm going to set our speed to 1 and I'm going to set our max speed to like 50. We'll see if that's slow enough. Now, as I move to the power cell, I'm going to try to move over there real slow so we can see it happen. I'm trying to hit the power cell with the transparent corner of my ship. There it goes. So my spaceship graphic image didn't touch the power cell, but this dead space outside of the player ship did. Now, of course, I thought, and everybody watching this thought, probably, that I just set up the circle collision shape, so that wouldn't happen. But that's where this bit of alert comes into play. The physics collision shape, which we set up right here, is only for collisions between other physics bodies. So because the power cell is not a physics body, it's just a regular old sprite or object, there is a second collision shape that this player ship has and that we need to adjust. And that's right here under Edit Hitboxes. And every sprite that you create as an object in GDevelop will have this Edit Hitbox. Only sprites that you create with the Physics 2 behavior will have this collision shape. So let's go back. Now we have to adjust this Edit Hitbox to be more in line with the shape of our object. And you can see you also get a preview here. There's this red tinted box around the sprite that does fill these transparent areas outside of our image. We don't want that. So what I'm going to do is right here use a custom collision mask. I'm going to choose that. And then it took our mask away. You can see that red mask is gone. The collision shape is gone from here. I'm going to add some points. I'm not sure how many we're going to need. So I'm just going to add it. It gave me five four to start with, whatever. I'm going to add a few more. Like I said, I'm not exactly sure how many we need. I'll add one more, see how that goes. Now you get these dots up here again, and I'm going to take these and start to follow the outline of our player ship. All the ones I just added are way up here 
I'm going to zoom in a little bit. There's a plus and minus up here to zoom in and out. I believe you can also zoom while I'm scrolling with my scroll wheel on my mouse. And then if I hold down my command key and use that scroll wheel, I can zoom in and out. I'm going to try to get a little closer here and pull these points around. This is a little bit of a pain. It would be nice if this had a larger preview window. Had a little more ability to move these points around a little better. But it works. So, so I'm just going to drag these. I don't want these to be exactly around the edge of this ship. I want them to be in just a little bit. So the player ship needs to overlap. the power cell just a little bit so you really have to hit it good I think I might need a couple more points here let's see I'm gonna add a couple more did I delete one yep let's see if two is enough sometimes you start getting this weird shape and you'll see these all have exclamation points and it says polygon is not convex. You can't have a collision shaped polygon that is not convex. And that's where it's all crisscrossing over itself here. So as you drag these points around, sometimes you have to readjust like I'm doing right here. Now you'll see that they don't crisscross hopefully anymore. There we go. All the alerts went away and it says the polygon has 12 vertices. Let's see how that looks. I'm going to do a couple minor adjustments here. If you're following along, you can add as many vertices as you like. If you want your collision shape to be more circular, obviously you need more points for that. This is going to be good enough for the tutorial here today. So you can see, let me zoom out a little bit. That's in. There we go. You can see now our collision shape is somewhat circular and somewhat inside the edge of our player ship. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to apply that. And now, as I move slowly over to the power cell, I got closer, but the power cell collision shape needs to be adjusted as well. So let's edit that now that we know what we're doing. I'm going to zoom in and do the same thing that we just did to the player ship. I'll fast forward through this, but if you want to follow along and do the same thing, feel free. There we go. That should be good enough for our purposes. I also want this animation to loop. I noticed it wasn't looping. So I'm going to click loop there and apply that. So now the player should have to pretty much get right over top of the power cell before it deletes. And it did. So that's a good start on the power cell. We're not going to need this wall. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I think I'm going to end this tutorial here. We've certainly covered a lot of ground. A lot of ground with the collision shapes and how they work. With layers and Z order. And grouping events and adding some non-physics collisions here today. So I'm going to end this. And when we come back in the third episode... We'll add some more detail here to the collision of the power cell. We want to add some score. Maybe we'll do our score and level and lives readout up here. And uh, keep moving along with this tutorial. So I hope to see you back in the third episode. Have fun making games.